considering the topic of our lesson this week. I didn't want, I didn't want for you to tar and feather me. So if you choose to do so, it will be because of what I read to you, which I did not like. I'll read to you. It is a pleasure and a privilege to study God's Word with you this morning. Amen. That last stanza that we sung, we will sit at His feet. Oh, sorry about that. I'll walk by His side in the way. Can you visualize that and not choke up? We will sit at His feet and we will walk by His side in the way the way. Amen. What a thought to keep ever present in our minds seven days a week. For 13 weeks we have been studying church in the community. The role of the church in the community. But as I looked at the title of our lesson for this week, I, I just cannot stop thinking about the title. I spent more time thinking about the title than the lesson. <laughs> How shall we wait? And then it has a question mark. Did you look, I mean, really, really look at the, what that question, what the question is asking here? How shall we wait? Question mark. Did any, did you come up with any thoughts, answers to that question? It's a question has a question mark after the end. How shall we wait? I wrote down, not passive, but active. Demonstrating God's love in our life. Wow! That's one of the words that I thought of. Active. In fact, I rewrote the title several times. <laughs> waiting actively or actively waiting. But this morning I awakened and another word popped into my mind. Were there any other thoughts that you had about the title this week? I think the picture got it all. Okay. This morning I awakened and the first thing that came to my mind was urgent. Urgently and actively waiting. Waiting actively and urgently. It doesn't matter how you rephrase it. It is a solemn, solemn thought. For 13 weeks, we have been focused on outreach programs to the community. And we have heard and read many, many programs that we can participate in. And programs are important because God is a God of order and not of confusion or disorder. Just last week, our topic was urban ministry in the end times. The thought that came recurring in my mind this week as I thought about the lesson was where should this active, urgent waiting be focused on? We know about the programs. We participated in the programs.
What do you think would make these programs different in the future as far as results than what we have experienced in the past? As you think of that, let me ask you this question. Do you think that it is God's will for us to still be here on this earth? No. no. So if I continue to do things in the future as I have done them in the past, what would you think of me if I thought that the results would be different in the future? You were insane. Someone labeled what I just asked you as the ultimate demonstration of stupidity. To continue to do in the future the way that I've done things in the past but expect for the results to be there. So, is there any problem with the programs that we have studied this past 13 weeks? I couldn't find any fault with the programs. And the literature, meeting the needs of the homeless, the hungry, those that need clothing, those that need encouragement. All of these are wonderful and wonderful uh, activities. The, uh, the thought that occurred to me was what kind of an agenda, what kind of a program did uh, Jesus follow when he was on this earth? He mingled, he sympathized, he listened, and he helped them. He met their needs. Yeah. He met their needs. Since Jesus tells us several times that he of himself could do nothing, how do you think he became sensitive to recognizing people's needs? Because of his love? Let me read to you from Steps to Christ, page 77 and 78. The love of Christ enshrined in the human heart like sweet fragrance cannot be hidden. Isn't that beautiful? Very descriptive. A desire to make known to others what a precious friend you have found in Jesus cannot be shut up. It is continuously expressed in every aspect of our lives. Thank you. So, should my focus be an agenda? Was it for Jesus? Didn't Jesus spend some evenings in prayer? All night. The whole night? Why, why do you think he felt interested to do that? Because he was madly in love with his heart. The Holy Spirit must have said it out. We've got a big day tomorrow. <laughs> We're going to be dealing with some situations that uh, you need some reinforcement. Not only the reinforcement that you always have through the Holy Spirit, but there's some huge, significant issues coming up to you. And so he prayed all night. Jesus relied on his Heavenly Father to create opportunities where he, Jesus, could witness. turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. How many of you graduated from high school, college, or graduate school? Great. What happened the day before you received your diploma? What happened? A speaker got up and gave what is known as a commencement address. What does the word commencement mean? Starting out. This is not the end of things. Now you have a new, you have a, some new challenges coming up. I just wanted to mention the fact that you asked the question before we went to this verse that um, him going to his father, and I, I'm thinking the fact that if we're, we're trying to do these things like you're saying without the blessing of God, then everything that we do has no 
has no eternal value. I mean, I can feed a guy, and I can do a lot of good things, but if it isn't heaven ordained, this meeting and the words and everything that's happening, then it's not going to have any earth in it, any lasting value. That, that really is the issue. Where should our activity be focused? Where should our activity be focused? Okay, let's take a look at John chapter 14. In chapter 13 of John, all the way through chapter 17, we have Jesus' commencement address to his disciples. Why? Well, because chapter 13 tells us that the Lord's Supper is what is being discussed in chapter 13. So, Jesus has a commencement address beginning in chapter 13 of John. Now, this is an interesting class. There's 12 men. Most of them had jobs, but they had been willing to set their jobs aside whenever Jesus wanted to go on a trip, which meant that he, they also were willing to leave their families. That's impressive. Because... They were relying completely on Jesus supplying the needs of their families. Financially and otherwise. So, let's begin with John chapter 14, beginning with verse 10. Philip has asked him a question. Show us the Father. Let's go right to verse 10. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? What does that mean? The one. Huh? The one. Yeah. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own initiative, but the Father abiding in me does his works. How do you like that? First time I read that, I said, no, I misread that. Then I read it over again. So what that means is that Jesus never took the initiative to open up his mouth unless what? The Father impressed him what to say and how to say it. And that was done through the Holy Spirit. But the original direction came from the Father in heaven. Look at verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on account of the works themselves. Now, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. What? For 13 weeks we've been talking about outreach in the community. How would you like to reach the point in your relationship with God where God starts performing miracles to you? Amen. Will that get people's attention? Amen. Will that get your attention? Do we need to get people's attention out there? Yes. We live in a world today that does not believe anything unless it's empirically established. Empirically means I want to see evidence. I want to see real things. That's what empirical means. So, here Jesus is saying in verse uh, 12, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works which I shall, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. Now what does that mean, greater works? Does that mean more important than what Jesus did, or does it mean more far-reaching now? Far-reaching. Far yes. I think the people of today want, want proof, not evidence. They want a demonstration. Mm -hmm. Well, so did the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. It says in written that there will be false proof, what people will think is proof. And so you have to be very aware of what's going on. Good. We're coming to that. <laughs> very good. Very good. <clears throat> All right. So, if we are abiding in Christ, Christ guarantees that He abides in us. And is this something we do physically, or is this a commitment from the symbolic heart? Okay. So that's really what we're focused on this morning. What 
should our focus be? What is it that we should actively and urgently be waiting for in our individual lives? Is that a question? Yes? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Say, uh, uh, the first blessing of justification by faith. Is peace of God. Good. Very good. Okay. Now, let's continue in the commencement address. And let's move over to chapter 15 of John. John chapter 15. And let's begin with verse 2. John 15, verse 2. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, God takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, He prunes it, that it may bear more fruit. I'm going to read that again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, Many people do not understand what that means. No problem. Do you believe that the author of the book Desire of Ages was inspired? Yes. You're going to be interested in what I'm about to read to you. Desire of Ages, page 676. Paragraph 4 from the top. My father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. While the graft is outwardly united with the vine, there may be no vital connection. Then there will be no growth or fruitfulness. So there may be an apparent connection with Christ without a real union with him by faith. What? Is everyone that claims to be a Christian going to be in hell? No. Is everyone that's a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church going to be in hell? No. That's what he's talking about. <clears throat> if they bear no fruit, they are false branches. Their separation from Christ involves a ruin as complete as that represented by the dead branch. If a man abide not in me, said Christ, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So, that is the explanation for verse 2. Now, let's go over to verse 4 of John 15. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I have read that so many times, I could almost rattle it off my memory. And then I began to think, about a beautiful area in California that I've been to many times, in the Napa Valley. The Napa Valley in Napa County, as well as Mendocino, they grow grapes. And as you drive through, it's very impressive. Everything is very orderly, but every vine has a stake that it's wrapped itself around. What happens to the vine if it does not wrap itself around a stake? It's it stuck to death. So Jesus is saying that he is what? The vine. What does that tell you about Jesus and his relationship with God as far as his mission to the surface itself? In order to survive, he had to abide in whom? The Father. Incredible illustration. So the vine is telling me 
that just like I found something to wrap myself around in order to grow and not be stoned to death, I am suggesting to you, branches, that you focus on abiding in me. Beautiful parable. Beautiful parable. But what a story it tells. Abide in me, verse 4, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. Do we need to spend any time on the fact that a branch by itself cannot be floating out there in space and produce fruit? But this is very visual. I hope I'm not insulting your intelligence by spending the time that I am on this parable, but Jesus is the one that chose this parable. I'm just reading it to you. <laughs> abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Again, we've studied for 13 weeks all of the fruit bearing that we should do. Wonderful. Wonderful. The question is, what makes it happen in a way? What is the factor that makes all of this happen in a way so that it's irrefutable to the unbelieving world? This word is, key word is abiding. Why? Because Jesus says so. Now, I'm going to read something to you from page 671 in Desire of Ages. The Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the Spirit of Truth, and thus he becomes the Comforter. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus, he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the spirit of truth working through the word of God that Christ subdues his chosen people to himself. You like that recipe? It would protect us. Yes. From hanging our own fruit. <laughs> and do <laughs> self-centered human beings like me need to watch out for that? Yes. Now. Let's take a look at John 16. John 16. Continuing the commencement address. John 16. Beginning with verse 8. And when He, the Holy Spirit, when He, the Holy Spirit, again comes, will convict, convince the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. The word sin is being used here as an adjective, speaking of a condition, not a verb. Okay? Look it up in your own concordance. Now look at verse 9. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Most people think that if they don't focus on keeping the Ten Commandments, they're going to burn in hell. But this passage, according to Jesus, says because they don't what? Believe it again. Because they don't believe in Him. What is 
the application of that to me as Seventh Day Adventist, Consider, considering all of the knowledge that we have about every conceivable topic in the Bible? <laughs> Jesus still has to be center of everything. You can't put the cart before the horse. So all of this outreach that we've been talking about for 13 weeks is wonderful. The question is, what triggers it? What makes it happen in a way that it at least has not happened in the past? Where's today? October 24th. Yeah, that's the in two in one month minus two days, it will be 172 years that Jesus moved from the first apartment to the second apartment. We're going to touch on that a little bit later. Okay, John 16. Let me read to you what the author of the book. Selected Messages, page 68 and 69, says about verse 9 and believing. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. That's a long time. They've been slaves for 430 years in Egypt. Now God takes them the longest way possible to the promised land. And when they get there, what happens? They believe that they're descendants of Abraham and God is fulfilling His promise to Abraham and He chooses Moses to take them the longest route possible. Two years, two months, and one day. And when they get there, He says, I want to write ten promises on your heart. And if you will what? Believe my promises... Then, in 11 days, I'm going to take you into the promised land. What did they say when they got to the promised land? Yes, God is powerful. God created everything. God separated the waters of the Dead Sea. But God cannot deliver us into the promised land. Have you seen the giants there, Moses? We're telling you the giants there. These people are armed to the teeth with metal weapons. Yes, God created everything. He brought us here, provided food, water, cloud in the daytime to keep us from the heat of the desert, fire over us to protect us. Our shoes didn't wear out. We had a daily catering service. But there's no way that God can deliver us into the promised land. No way. God said, okay. Go out for a 40 year hike. Because I want to get your attention. For 40 years did unbelief, murmuring, and rebellion shut out ancient Israel from the land of Canaan. The same sins have delayed the entrance of modern Israel into the heavenly Canaan. Continue. In neither case were the promises of God at fault. It is the unbelief, the worldliness and consecration and strife among the Lord's professed people that have kept us in this world of sin and sorrow so many years. Select the messages, volume 1, page 68 and 69. I'm just reading to you. I'm giving you the reference so that you can read it for yourself. Okay? Verse 10, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you no longer behold me. I have never heard a sermon on that verse. Do you know what Jesus is saying there? What did Jesus say to John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 11? I've come to be baptized. And what did John the Baptist say? Whoa. What? What? I'm not worthy to carry the, you know, to tie the latches on your sandals. You want me to baptize you? What did Jesus say? Let it be done so that all what? Righteousness. Righteousness can be fulfilled. The word righteousness there is dikaiosune in Greek, which means you inherit, the world inherits, a title of what? From Adam and Eve, our great grandparents. Condemnation. Now Jesus is saying, I need to develop a new title 
title of righteousness. It's imputed. It's something that is given to you. That's what the word righteousness. The word righteousness appears nine times in the New Testament. 